Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series. Podcast episodes are available on VHHA.com and on popular podcast hosting apps, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and many others. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Network, the Virginia Audio Collective, and the Family Podcast Network. Podcast episodes also air each Sunday at noon on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, and 820 AM across Central Virginia, 1650 AM in Hampton Roads, 105.1 FM and 1050 AM in Lynchburg, and Wednesdays at 1 PM on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send questions, comments, feedback, or guest suggestions to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. Again, that's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. And today we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Paula Ferrada, a board-certified surgeon, mentor, and educator who serves as Division Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at ANOVA for a conversation about her path to medicine, her career, and much more. So with that, welcome to the show, Dr. Ferrada. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for including me. I'm honored to be here. Well, it's our pleasure. And to just get things rolling, we like to start these conversations by diving a little bit deeper into the background of our guests. Dr. Ferrada, you're an accomplished surgeon and professor of surgery whose path to practicing medicine in the U.S. began in Columbia, where you attended medical school. And as I understand it, as a teen and young adult, you also had some early success as a television presenter and commercial actress. And then you completed medical school and then had stops at the University of Miami, an academic medical center in Massachusetts, the University of Pittsburgh for training, before progressing to roles at the University of Maryland and at Virginia Commonwealth University, and then since 2021 at ANOVA. I imagine that those surface details are just part of your unique personal story. So beyond that, what are some essential things that people should know about you? That's um, it's a good summary. So thank you so much for doing that. I think that, yes, I learned many things while I was growing up. I think one thing that might be unique is that my dad is a very well-known surgeon in, in Latin America. My mom is a nurse. And uh, because laws and things are different in South America, I and every time that we didn't have a nanny, I ended up in the hospital. So the hospital actually, to me, felt like like family, like my extended family. And it was when I was uh, 12 years old, the first time that I scrubbed in, in a case, in a surgical case. I think for the people that know me, they know that I am a, a bit intense. And I imagine that the operating room um, uh, secretary got a little bit tired of my intensity and just like said, well, you want to see your dad? Let me give you some scrubs and put you in the <laughs> OR. So I went in the operating room. My dad, in Latin America at the time, surgeons, trauma surgeons were surgeons of the body. Basically, whatever the patient needed, you did. Vascular, oncology, trauma. And he was scrubbing in in a case for a rupture or aortic aneurysm, then the clamps move and the blood hits the ceiling. And that moment at age 12, I knew that I needed to be a surgeon. And there was no way I could shake it. My dad tried to get me interested in dermatology and anything else. But I knew I was a surgeon and I knew I was a trauma surgeon. So almost like surgery picked me. And then when I came to the United States, yes, I did uh, research at the University of Miami. I did my internship. And then I was super, um, I guess, lucky and uh, the stars aligned and I was able to secure a position at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And um, at the time, I, it never, ever occurred to me that I was going to end up graduating from a Harvard program. But because the opportunity presented itself and because after, after a lot of hard work and pushing as a foreign graduate, it's hard to become a surgeon in the United States. But... I ended up being the first Colombian uh, female to graduate from a Harvard uh, system um, educational program in surgery. And that was amazing because I switched from somebody that was begging for opportunities to somebody that had a lot of opportunities then to do fellowship. And I went to Pittsburgh. It was wonderful. Then I did acute care surgery at shock trauma in Maryland. And I spent 11 years uh, at a center in Richmond before I came to Inova. Yeah, that's pretty much the path. I think that from all of it that I take back from the good things and the not so great things is that once you have a mission and you know what you love, you have a vision of where you should be, kind of like the universe aligns itself to help you and to align opportunities for you and persistence, perseverance and resilience will get you to the point where you where you want to be. 
Well, that's that's fascinating. I appreciate you telling us about your family's connection to medicine and how that perhaps shaped the career path that you ultimately had. And then, as you said, you know, with a few breaks and then a lot of persistence and resilience, you can go a long way on your own steam. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Your award-winning clinical career has spanned grant-supported research in trauma resuscitation, work as a mentor and professor of surgery for medical students, and as a recognized leader in ultrasound education. In addition to your other duties at ANOVA, you are also the program director for the Surgical Critical Care Fellowship at ANOVA Fairfax Hospital, which is a 12-month program to prepare fellows for work as board-certified subspecialists. From what I've read, you've been very intentional about blazing a trail for other future physicians to follow. It's well documented that healthcare continues to contend with current and future projected workforce shortages among physicians, nurses, psychiatrists, and many other roles. I think it's fair to say that many people become teachers of sorts as they progress deeper into their careers. That seems to have come earlier for you, and I'm curious to know what inspired that in you. That's a great question. I always have found incredible pleasure in helping people, not only helping patients, but helping people succeed. And now that I'm in this position of leadership in Inova, I discovered, uh, because this is the thing in surgery and in medicine, we are trained to learn physiology and pathology and procedures, right, and technique and anatomy and this and that. But there are not many opportunities during medical school or during residency or fellowship where you get trained how to be a mentor, when you get trained how to be a teacher, where you get trained how to be a leader. And um, and I never, you know, I love leadership and I love to help develop people. And even in my uh, time where I was just like 100% clinical uh, duties, I always found time to learn a little bit about leadership, learn a little bit about how to be a better mentor. And I just always gravitated to that. And I never knew how important of a skill was. And now that I'm here in Inova, where mentoring and where leadership has such a huge emphasis in uh, creating a better future, right, for our patients, for our mentees, for our students, and um, and recruiting that workforce that is going to help us all succeed. I think now it makes sense that, you know, I am actually good at this and I love being a leader and I love being a mentor. I put a lot of intention in that because I wanted to, I wanted people not to have a difficult time achieving their dreams. And I wanted people not to go through the same difficulties that I went through when I first came to the United States. And also, place a lot of intention for minorities. I think in general medicine can be a toxic environment in some places. And I think it's really important for us to continue to recruit and retain the workforce that is going to maintain our healthcare and in the United States to be very intentional about creating spaces of psychological safety for our trainees. So that, that those are the reasons. I want to talk a little bit more about your time with ANOVA. Recently, we had some guests from ANOVA on the podcast, including Dr. Henna Kreshi, and they were talking about the use of the Unite Us platform and its ability to connect patients and providers with social support and community-based wraparound services to make sure that patients can get support beyond the four walls of the hospital, beyond just the acute clinical needs, but can support some of their other needs for full person support. And I know that ANOVA Northern, serves Northern Virginia, and Northern Virginia has a very diverse population being on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., with folks from many different walks of life. You touched on that in your last response just a moment ago, but I'm curious to know about how your background as someone who emigrated from Colombia and now is working in a community with a lot of diversity, how you bring those perspectives into your clinical work. Thank you for asking that question. I think that it was specifically in trauma where we have patients that were completely normal. I'm not diminishing the other problems, of course, chronic issues and cancer and everything is important, correct? But in trauma, you were completely normal absolutely no disabilities, your life was fine, and boom, you have a car crash, or boom, something happened in your life, and now you're not. 
now you have to adapt to a new situation. And even though we as physicians see, well, you know, we save your life, so you should be grateful and happy. The pain, the disability, the life changes. And that's so important that we, like you said at the beginning of your question, of your statement, that we take care of the patient, but also of the family. Not only the clinical and the organic issues that we take care of, but the patients as a whole. Because recovery is, it only starts really, people truly recover if you recover as a whole. Now, in terms of the diversity of Northern Virginia, I love it. I think Innova, for those that are not familiar with the area, Innova is not only one hospital in Fairfax, which is our flagship hospital and it's huge and we have amazing services, but we are a five hospital system. The ER at Fairfax is the third busiest ER in the country. And the population that we serve in Northern Virginia of 3.2 million people is a very diverse population. So therefore, having people in the workforce that actually represent those patients is, the patient population is this key. I love my job. I love going every day to Inova and see that diversity on my peers, on the leadership of every and each hospital, the leadership of the service lines, and the support that is given to continue to grow and not only recruit, but retain those people of diverse backgrounds. I'm really proud of that. And uh, I think it's super important for our patients to feel represented in the workforce. And you just talked about trauma care, and I want to segue to that. If you could tell me a little bit more about your clinical work as Division Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. And I'm just curious how much of your duties are divided between perhaps administrative functions versus clinical practice. And if you could just give us a little bit more insight, you talked a little bit about, you know, for example, someone involved in a car accident, but what kinds of interventions are you involved in from a clinical perspective? That's a wonderful question because it's not only about me, it's about my team. We have, um, we have a level one trauma center in Fairfax. We have a level three in Loudoun that will be at two soon. And we're preparing to build a trauma center at level two in Alexandria. So we have a trauma system, not only a trauma center. And with that comes a bunch of people that are part of that team. We have emergency medicine physicians. We have nurses in the emergency room, but also in the ICUs and in the floors, and we have rehab, and we have surgeons. I have 13 surgeons in the level one. I have six surgeons in the level two, hopefully six surgeons in the other level two that we're getting together. We have nurse educators. We have advanced care professionals, respiratory therapies. It's a group, a really big group of people. I have about 300 team members in the trauma system that we have in Northern Virginia. And what is it that we do? So it, often for people that are not involved in health care, I get asked, oh, so you're a trauma surgeon, so you are you go to the ER. And I'm like, yeah, well, technically, yes, that's part of what we do, but not only the ER. So if something happens to you, God forbid, you get you get caught accidentally, you get shot, or you get, you're part of a car crash and you get severely injured, you come to one of our trauma centers. Let's say, for example, a level one trauma center, and we meet you in the emergency room, and there's a trauma activation, and we have anesthesiologists, respiratory therapy, emergency medicine physicians, residents, APPs, surgeons there to make sure that we take care of anything that is going to kill you within the first uh, few seconds and minutes of, of you arriving. Once that's taken care of, either we go to the operating room to finish and make sure that you're stable or to the ICU and to the floor, depending on of your injuries. And from that, from the operating room, let's say, um, God forbid, you have an injury that requires a surgical intervention. You go to the operating room, then you go to intensive care unit, then you go to the floor, and then after that, you go to rehab. And all the continuum longitudinal care from uh, injury, from, from entering our system to leaving our system, is a team effort that is not is not only one surgeon, one person, one nurse, one leader. It's all of us together working in symphony. It's like it's chaotic for people that see it from the outside, but it's the symphony of chaos that brings the trauma patient the best chance of surviving. 
And I appreciate you giving us that introduction. And just for the benefit of listeners who may be unfamiliar with some of the things that Dr. Farad is talking about, there are varying levels of trauma center designation from one through five. And this, as Dr. Farad said, brings together care teams to respond to acute and emergent situations involving patients who may have been seriously injured. And Virginia, thankfully, has a wide range of trauma centers, designated trauma centers in regions throughout the Commonwealth. So I appreciate you sharing a little bit more insight about that. Dr. Farada, in addition to the many professional hats you wear, it's noteworthy that you've carved out an online presence is a bit of an outspoken advocate for issues and causes about which you're passionate. We talked about diversity and mentorship just a moment ago. Clearly, you you do not seem like anything like a shrinking violet. You seem uh, very comfortable and confident in sharing your views. I've noted that you've engaged on these issues publicly on online forums, social media, and things like that. And anyone who spends time online knows that being vocal, being outspoken can attract both praise and derision. I've heard you use the phrase that people who are successful are going to invite haters. But I wonder how you sort of balance and and manage that. Because on the one hand, being an advocate, being an ally is very important. But at the same time, as I mentioned, it can also invite some unwanted attention as well. So just one, I'd like to hear your thoughts about, you know, balancing that out in your approach to being vocal and to sharing your thoughts and perspective in that regard? That's a great question. And I think about this often. I feel, me, Paula Ferraren, doesn't have to be anybody else's way of thinking. I feel that that I am privileged to be in the position that I am. And I am privileged to have all the opportunities that I have. And I consider a huge honor that I get to do for a living what I love. And you know, when, when you hear these stories of people wanting to be a rock star and becoming a rock star, that's my story, except that my want and my need was becoming a surgeon in the United States. And I don't take that privilege lightly. I feel that I made it and that's wonderful. So why can I not use my voice to help people that are on the way, right? And there's so many times where we get disengaged or we get discouraged for I don't know, either toxic environments or toxic people or naysayers or negativity. And I wish, sometimes I wish when I was in moments like that where things got hard, that I had somebody that I could ask or that could tell me things are going to be okay or this is normal or keep going, right? So I think that's what it is for me. I feel because I have this huge honor and privilege of Living my dream of being a surgeon in the United States, I also have the responsibility to help support those people that are in the pipeline. And that's why I do it. And you know what? I I think when we all, when we all take a stand, I think that there's a great saying, yes, that if you think that you don't have enemies, it's a really dangerous place to be because you do have enemies, you just don't know who they are. Anybody that stands for something, that takes a stand, will have people that think differently and not enemies is kind of like a harsh term. We have people that will disagree. And some people disagree online with harsh comments because it's really easy to be brave behind a screen. And some people disagree in front of you and, and want to have that is a more productive disagreement because you then can have uh, conversations. And I think I think inviting a healthy conflict is important. Otherwise, you just surround yourself with a bunch of people that are just telling you yes to everything and you're not really, you know, advancing. So, yes, I have said that before. All winners have haters, and that's okay. When you stand for something that you believe is unrealistic to think that people are going to get up and clap because you did something that was just and it was right. You're going to have people that are going to disagree, and that's okay. You have to be okay with that. If not, if you're not okay with that, then you're going to have to stay in the gray zone. Then you'll be really hard to commit to anything, right? Commitment and for something that you believe on requires sometimes you know, hardship. It's part of the road, and it's not only acceptable, it's welcome. It's how we get better. Well, we certainly appreciate you using your voice to share your thoughts in joining us on this podcast. We are almost done, but before we go, we have a tradition here where we like to close things out by asking our guests a pair of sort of fun, quirky questions to wrap up. 
And so to keep things interesting, we have a list of 10 mystery questions. So if you select two numbers between 1 and 10, I'll give you those corresponding questions. Between 1 and 10? Correct. 9 and 2. Okay. <laughs> 9 and 2. We'll take them in that order. 9. If you were miraculously granted one wish, what would you wish for? For my family to live happy and healthy. I think anybody that's got a family can co-sign on that sentiment. And then number two, this will probably take a little bit more involved answer. If you were stranded on a deserted island, what one book, one album, and one movie would you take with you to keep yourself company? We will spot you a copy of the religious text of your choice. So other than that, what are your three entertainment survival kit picks? That is hilarious. That's like one of the things that my children will say. And I always say, I no, I don't want to be stranded in, stranded in, <laughs> in an island. <laughs> that would be my choice. No, I choose to opt out. I don't want to be in an island. No, but seriously, I would not bring a book. I will bring a, a pen and paper so then I can write my experiences and I can journal because I think that will be helpful for not only for survival, but also for keeping my mind alive, because I, I don't think that one book will do, right? I think I, I truly, and this goes for everything that I believe in my life. I believe in being the writer in your own story. Live your life like a book that somebody else will think that is super interesting to read. So yeah, I will not bring a book. I will bring a pen and paper. Um, movie. I don't know what movie. Um, I like a bunch of movies, but I guess maybe Shawshank Redemption. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. Okay. I really like it. And classic. then what else is it? And, and then, then, and then so one album. Movie. Album is the last one. Uh, you mean, we're talking about music, like an correct. LP? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Correct. I would do like like a medley of Colombian songs, like merengue, salsa, all of the things that I miss that I don't get to dance anymore. I don't get to dance to it anymore because I live in the United States. <laughs> that would be it. Well, there's got to be some good salsa clubs in D.C., aren't there? Well, yeah, but I have a family. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I am a, I'm a division chief. I, you know, I'm just no, trying to no survive. Free time. Put one more thing. No, no one more thing to do for me. No, no need. It's okay. Well, Dr. Ferrada, I appreciate you taking some time to speak with us and to share your perspective. And with that, that brings us to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review and subscribe so that you know when new episodes are available. And we want to once again thank our guest, Dr. Paula Ferrada of Anova, for joining us today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun.